Okay, so uh, welcome everyone, and uh, let's uh, continue with our post lunch session. We have Elizabeth Cross who will talk about weak lensing without shape noise. Thank you. So first of all, um, a huge thank you for the, to the organizers for inviting me. I must say the school last week has been the most energizing week of the year for me so far. But based on the talks that I've heard today, this week then might come second. So today, um, today I want to talk about a new weak lensing measurement technique that we are developing. Okay, so today I want to talk about a new weak lensing measurement technique that we're developing at the University of Arizona and the JPL. Uh, all the um, detailed work is uh, carried out by our fantastic grad students and postdocs, Jia Shan Shu, uh, Pranjal Rares, sitting here in the audience, Yu Shi Huang, Hong Jin Huang, and then for a while also rotation student Maggie Smith. So um, I praise them for all the uh, detailed results. And you can blame Tim Eifler, Eric Huff, and me for not really uh, following the theme of this conference. We are actually trying to do um, science with less data rather than more. So the idea here is that we want to develop a different uh, way um, to measure weak lensing, uh, which uh, is typically a very um, complicated statistical measurement. Uh, in principle, we want to um, uh, measure this uh, slight alignment of galaxy shapes due to uh, weak lensing. And that's um, uh, uh, traditionally uh, in, child, in very small signal. The uh, shape dispersion of galaxies of or, sigma epsilon of order 0.25. And then we are trying to uh, measure a percent level shape distortion. Um, and uh, yeah, that is complicated because the intrinsic shape of galaxies is unobservable and degenerate with shear. That means that exactly uh, we are then averaging over many nearby galaxies to average out the intrinsic shape. Uh, but the residual noise in that uh, then still is of order sigma epsilon squared uh, divided by number of galaxies. And in addition, uh, we have a lot of complicated systematics. Precisely, we have to push to fainter and fainter galaxies in order to increase the statistical power of this measurement. So let me just say photometric redshift, shear calibration, intrinsic alignments, and probably some faces here in the audience will be scared. Uh, we are trying to bypass that by now using kinematics. Uh, to um, break the geometry between shapes and shear, and thus uh, eventually raise the signal to noise uh, of the weak lensing measurement to of order one per galaxy. So let's uh, first understand what we want to do with the cartoon. Uh, without spectral information, these two galaxies would look um, the same. And exactly due, due to this uh, shape shear degeneracy, we can't tell whether they, uh, this galaxy is she sheared but face on or inclined but not sheared. But then, thanks to spectra, um, if we take the major axis rotation curve, we can tell whether that, that uh, this galaxy must be face on, while this galaxy must be in inclined. Uh, at the moment, uh, in this cartoon, of course, that's just a qualitative trend. We'll make it quantitative uh, on the next slide using, uh, or in the, in the following slides, by now imposing galaxy scaling relation. But let's uh, first talk about the effect of shear on galaxies and how exactly we are going to use uh, this type of kinematic information. So as a reference frame for two shear components here, we'll now just use uh, the galaxy uh, reference frame and define the major axis um, here um, as the direction along which uh, the gamma plus shear goes, and then gamma cross goes at 45 degrees from it. Uh, uh, now a shear along this major axis that will just stretch uh, the galaxy and similarly remap the rotation field. So in this um, illustration here, uh, the uh, dashed um, contours are the um, uh, photometry and um, velocity field before lensing, and then they re get, uh, get uh, remapped um, due to lensing. Uh, uh, in, in, in this case here, then the impact of a shear along the major axis uh, on both morphology and kinematics is similar one to the one of a different inclination angle. So that's difficult. For, uh, for the um, 45 degree shear case, although we have the remapping again of, um, um, of photometry and kinematics. Uh, now, again, shown as this kind of twist, but importantly, um, remapping of the uh, galaxy photometry is not a solid body rotation. So that means that uh, after lensing, uh, the um, uh, photometric uh, and kinematic minor lenses will not be aligned. 
So there will be a residual um, uh, rotation now along what appears to be the photometric minor axis. And uh, that tells us that there is this twisting that tells us that there is uh, this cross shear acting. That is an effect that was already pointed out in the early 2000s. And uh, radio astronomers, astronomers used that already 15 years ago to measure one component of the shear. In order to make progress on this case, though, uh, we need uh, more information to, const uh, to constrain um, the shear along the major axis and inclination angle. Uh, there's uh, two different ways uh, of doing that primarily. Uh, one is to restrict to a uh, specific geometry. And that is uh, if we uh, uh, basically have uh, one big mass, uh, like a cluster or massive galaxy dominating uh, weak lensing, uh, then we have this preferred geometry and directly know um, what the direction of uh, what the tangential direction is and which, uh, which direction shear will act on. So that means that uh, we can then uh, break uh, this degeneracy in this particular geometry. And that uh, is uh, the, the type of um, kinematics uh, kinematic lensing that you've probably seen and may have seen in the literature in quite a few papers. This is beautiful um, because uh, now we can uh, reconstruct galaxy galaxy lensing or cluster lensing from just one component. But for many other applications, we actually do need both shear components. So that means we will need some additional information. And what we are going to use here is the Tully-Fisher relation. Um, uh, a galaxy scaling relation between the circular velocity and absolute magnitude of stellar mass or other um, um, traces of galaxy size, uh, which has been observed to be um, quite a tight scaling relation uh, that's in place uh, up to redshift 1.7 at least. Uh, and uh, for example, um, Rainer Bell Reyes uh, estimated uh, um, it's scattered to be around uh, 0 0.05, uh, 0 0.05 dex. So this is a pretty tight scaling relation. And that's exactly the prior that we want to impose so that uh, uh, when we then go out and measure uh, the um, uh, rotation velocity uh, versus uh, some absolute magnitude of stellar mass, we can use uh, this offset of the measurement from the tally fisher relation to infer the inclination angle. And now then for our disk galaxies, this inclination angle exactly determines the unlensed galaxy ellipticity. So you can think of uh, measuring the major axis component of the shear as um, now um, measure, measuring the difference between the unlensed and observed shape, because we can uh, precisely predict that unlensed galaxy shape uh, from the tally fisher relation or from galaxy kinematics. That sounds great in theory. Let's get one step closer to data analysis and figure out how well we can uh, expect to do with this in practice. So that means uh, I'll now take you through uh, the measurement pipeline and uh, a shape noise estimate that uh, Prandtl has set up. Uh, this starts out with um, realistic simulations um, so uh, that we can uh, put in uh, a known shear and um, uh, specify to uh, the instrument of our choice. And uh, then we produce an image and a major and minor axis spectra. These simulations though are way too slow to use in an MCMC. Uh, so uh, uh, Prandtl then developed a fast of a 2D forward model um, that again produces the image and now a simple approximation for the spectrum so that we can run that in, a, in an MCMC and uh, produce a shear constraint on a per galaxy basis. Uh, in this project, we've specified two um, Deimos observations. Uh, so um, spectrograph on Keck with, an exp uh, with a typical uh, um, spectrum um, signal to noise ratio of order 30. So um, uh, these are not outrageously expensive observations. And here's just one example of how the mock spectrum uh, approximates the Deimos observations in our detailed uh, pipeline. Uh, this includes um, accounting for uh, sky emission, the atmosphere and um, instrument and CCD effects uh, and point spread function. And uh, the uh, input galaxies are typically based on Gelsen. So that's the slow process to produce these uh, relatively high fidelity simulations. And then uh, the fast forward model um, starts also out with, an, um, with a surface profile, uh, and uh, then we apply a shear and a rotation, which are a fast matrix, matrix observations in both cases. Uh, but uh, in a 2, uh, 2D fast forward model, then um, the spectrum model um, is simpler um, uh, based on uh, more limited uh, transformations. But runtime uh, is um, uh, very different. Uh, so that means that we really need to first uh, check, check that uh, these approximations that we um, do to have a fast forward model uh, work sufficiently well. And that's um, what we show here. 
um, analyzing um, a synthetic AD2 spectrum uh, with the fast forward model. And um, in this case, uh, we um, do put in a covariance to have a signal to noise of about 30, uh, but uh, the uh, model data itself um, is noiseless so that we don't have um, any biases from noise yet. And then you can uh, uh, see here beautifully uh, posteriors on the two shear components obtained from, from two galaxies at different inclinations. And the shear posteriors are unbiased, which means that fitting 11 parameters to each galaxy is not a hopeless um, pr proposal. Uh, we can also see that the constraining power depends on inclination, uh, which makes sense because uh, in the limit of a totally edge on galaxy, there would not be much to fit. So that's the trend that we see here. So with uh, this uh, great reassurance, uh, we can now um, graduate to noisy images to check that um, noise causes only scatter, not biases. Because clearly the shear inference here is a nonlinear process in the noise. We have to um, really be careful about noise biases that have killed many shear estimate, estimation methods in the past. So that's what Pranjal did. We start out with a galaxy ensemble of different inclinations. Um, we're making a uniform um, uh, distribu distribution. And then for each of those galaxy inclinations, we generate a large number of different noise realizations. Each of those uh, is then as analyzed um, um, to a fit a shear component or infer shear components through an MCMC on that image galaxy. Uh, then we obtain the mean posterior. At that point, we have to check for noise biases. And if things look good, then we can combine the different um, inclinations to find the gated population level um, average uh, of the expected noise of this measurement. So first, uh, let's look at the bias of measured shear um, as a function of input. Uh, in this plot, uh, you can see the uh, bias in the estimated shear as a function of um, galaxy inclination. So clearly, uh, arrow bars get larger as we uh, move from um, close to phase on to edge on, as expected. Uh, but uh, the two shear components um, are inferred um, in an unbiased way. And then graduating uh, to uh, slightly more complicated cases, we show here now the um, measured um, two shear components as a function of input, uh, just uh, putting in one uh, uh, shear component at a time. So if we put in a major axis shear component, we recover that um, pretty well. And importantly, also, there is no crosstalk from uh, between the two shear components. Here's the same case for, for the cross shear. Typically, in the measurements, one then quantifies how well these methods do in terms of uh, shear calibration biases, uh, which uh, at our current level of precision are very well within error bars. Uh, this may look um, still not quite at the level of precision cosmology yet, but this is an important step. Uh, many other shear estimation um, methods have already failed at this stage because noise biases were just too severe. So this looks great. Based on that, we can then do the ensemble average over all inclinations to get our estimate of this important quantity, sigma epsilon, which is of order 0.3 for a traditional weak lens. And as to be, as to be expected, our kinematic lensing inference, of course, um, depends on the signal to noise of the spectrum. Um, as there's a clear trend now that uh, increasing a signal to noise of the uh, spectrum data, of course, increases the precision of the measurement. Uh, no big news here. Uh, then uh, the uh, orange points uh, show what happens if we now re restrict uh, to galaxies with an inclination cut, uh, which is an interesting consideration, of course, when we think about how to optimize the survey. And another interesting study that, of course, we can do is um, reduce the model complexity. So uh, in our standard procedure, we have uh, 11 parameters for each galaxy. That means we, of course, marginalize over a lot of um, um, prior volume um, um, to describe our galaxies. If we were able to get away with a simpler um, description of um, galaxy spectra and images, that would drastically improve uh, the performance of this method. But that's something that we still have to figure out uh, in practice, of course. Now expanding a bit uh, on this uh, nice realization that the performance of the method uh, is better um, if we can restrict to um, um, closer to phase on galaxies. Let's look at that uh, in some more detail. So um, starting out here with uh, the axis on the right, uh, you can see the fraction of galaxies that will be included as a function of um, cat on sine i. Really, uh, for um, randomly oriented population of galaxies, most of them will be um, fairly close to edge on. So that's where most of the galaxies are. And then we can uh, look at the scaled uh, uh, shape noise, that is a sigma epsilon 
um, normalized by square root of, gal of number of galaxies to account for this um, 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 for this uh, um, distribution of uh, galaxy orientations. And you can see that uh, the gains at high inclinations is very slow. So uh, if we are limited by number of our spectra we can take, that means uh, going wider uh, and uh, leaving out the close to edge on galaxies uh, will be um, the preferable strategy. If of course um, we are limited by a survey area that can be reached from a telescope, there is still some improvement, um, including all galaxies uh, that are accessible. Now, those were all simulations, but clearly we're building up to a specific measurement. And our first application uh, will be galaxy-galaxy uh, -galaxy lensing using uh, Deep2 data. So that's um, an archival pencil beam survey. Uh, and we want to do galaxy-galaxy -galaxy lensing uh, in the Deep2 footprint. Uh, so, um, in order to do so, we rely on one of the standard um, um, galaxy samples for galaxy-galaxy -galaxy lensing, that is CMAS. There's an amazing 280 CMAS galaxies uh, in the Deep2 footprint for people who do galaxy-galaxy uh, -galaxy lensing. Uh, it's obvious that's a very small number to do galaxy galaxy lensing, but we have this different approach of measuring the lensing signal. Uh, so we believe that we will be able uh, to uh, measure uh, the tangential shear profile um, of uh, CMAS galaxies in the D2 uh, footprint uh, with kinematic lensing according uh, to uh, all these uh, bar shaped error bars here, depending on particular uh, source uh, signal to noise cuts. And uh, you can see that uh, these error bars are kind of comparable to error bars that um, Alexei Leotho got measuring galaxy galaxy lensing of CMAS in the C with a CFHT data. Um, now, for this much smaller footprint. Also, for comparison, these uh, broad orange bands show you how well we expect we would be able to measure tangential shear uh, in the deep two footprint using just a galaxy shapes, a traditional weak lensing. We still have some more work to do. Deep2 was not designed uh, to, uh, to do kinematic lensing, so we didn't choose the slit directions. And that means we have to do um, uh, a bit more gymnastics uh, to do our inference, but we're working on it. And hopefully then uh, this demonstration will show that um, uh, we can use kinematic lensing to do precision uh, galaxy galaxy lensing measurements for much smaller lens samples. And that should be really interesting for a wide range of galaxy evolution studies, because that means we can, for example, now bin um, much more um, uh, finally, by some uh, secondary property and uh, really push forward assembly bias studies. Another uh, application that we're working towards is uh, to do this measurement uh, with a Roman Space Telescope, uh, which will um, soon provide a space quality imaging and GRISM data uh, with a um, moderate um, GRISM resolution of uh, about um, 460. Uh, and uh, by design already, there will be um, 2,000 square degrees of overlapping imaging and GRISM survey uh, in the reference design. So this data is going to come. Uh, we don't have to propose for it. Uh, we just want to analyze it differently. The plan so far, of course, is to do the traditional shape-based lensing and then the galaxy redshift survey. Um, and we now just want to combine those two data sets to do kin kinematic lensing. The first question, of course, then is whether this GRISM uh, will be sufficient for our type of measurement. And there we can uh, extrapolate um, from uh, past HST um, observations uh, where the um, GRISM uh, in, um, um, in right camera three uh, rec uh, has three times worse resolution than the Roman um, um, GRISM, but recovers uh, rotation velocities with a precision of about 15 to 30 kilometers per second. And that is now already brings us uh, to the level of the scatter and the telefisher relation, which basically is. Um, um, the, the limit to which we um, need to know our galaxy rotation curve. There's not much gain if we measure um, galaxy rotation curves much better than the scatter and the telefisher relation. So this looks promising. Next ingredient, um, and uh, Jeshon has uh, gone through um, fairly detailed um, simulations already, what uh, the, uh, um, the Roman imaging and GRISM um, data will look like uh, in the presence of shear. Uh, so uh, based on that, we've again made our uh, shape model estimates, um, uh, figuring out what kind of sigma epsilon we can expect for the Roman data. Final ingredient is, then is the number of galaxies that we can do this for. Uh, so for, for that, um, we can start out uh, from the um, reference catalogs uh, that are based on um, uh, candles largely, and uh, uh, then figure out uh, what type of, how many galaxies to expect for a traditional and kinematic lensing. 
for traditional lensing. Others have done that estimate already, finding that there will be a source density of about 50 galaxies per square arc minute. And uh, imposing um, uh, um, emission um, of sex, um, cuts and um, also cuts on half um, half a light radius, um, as we need uh, some a minimum galaxy size to do this uh, detailed kinematics fitting. And a 50% 50, 50 success rate, we expect about four galaxies per square arc minute for our kinematic lensing measurement. So factor 10 reduction in number density, and also roughly a factor 10 reduction in shape noise, since uh, we want to optimize sigma epsilon squared over number density. This is great news. Dishon has then taken that forward uh, uh, through detailed um, simulated analyses uh, to um, figure out what the gain in cosmology constraining power would be. And I show that here for both uh, dark energy and standard omega m s8 um, parameter spaces, where in both cases the black contours are traditional weak lensing as planned for the Roman reference survey. And then the uh, blue and orange contours are our forecasts how well kinematic lensing will do using slightly different assumption about systematics. But clearly here uh, we expect about uh, um, we, uh, we um, expect a substantial uh, enhancement in constraining power, or 1.5 to 3.5 or so, depending on parameter space. Um, just by analyzing the data that will be produced differently. Of course, uh, in all of this, I've still glanced over systematics. Let's expand on that a bit. In traditional uh, lensing, uh, the key ones are redshifts shape measurements and intrinsic alignments. And uh, each of those is becoming a major challenge. There's almost a working group uh, for each of them. Uh, uh, for kinematic lensing, we will of course bypass photometric um, redshifts as we need spectra for each galaxy. So that's solved. Um, we do need to measure the shapes of galaxies, but uh, we're restricting to uh, galaxies that are bright enough that we um, get um, spectra. So that means we now do uh, shape measurements at high signal to noise meaning that all these noise bias effects are in, uh, that um, become more and more challenging uh, for relensing are not an issue, and we will also not be affected by blending. Finally, um, in uh, this kinematic lensing technique, we measure the unlensed galaxy shape from the telefisher relation, but that would include any um, intrinsic alignment uh, contribution if there was one for this galaxy. It will definitely be uh, uh, um, um, uh, suppressed as it would be second order and perturbation theory, but it's included in our um, intrinsic uh, in, in our um, galaxy inclination estimate from the telefish relation. So that's less an issue. Are we done? Uh, not quite. There's still some astrophysics that we need to worry about. In our current pipeline, we have an intrinsically round disk, a smooth surgical eye profile, and cylindrical symmetric rotation curves. Of course, real galaxies are not like that. So we need to uh, check these assumptions. Uh, our main tool for that um, uh, is uh, TNG uh, galaxies and obtaining um, detailed mock observations of, of the kinematic lensing procedure from those galaxies that will include all the complications so that we can um, uh, figure out the impact of um, astrophysical systematics on a per, per galaxy basis and to figure out how much that contributes to the scatter. In addition to um, increased scatter, then there's also a question whether there could be biases due to astrophysics. And that means that uh, we need to think about intrinsic alignment analogs. While there is no um, standard intrinsic alignments, there could be other astrophysics correlated with the tidal field that would then enter the shear um, um, predictions similar to intrinsic alignments. Let me give you one example of that. The first thing that we worried about here is the environment dependence of the telefisher relation. Uh, um, that's a reasonable thing to assume that the telefisher relation is not quite universal. And the question then is how does it vary with, uh, with environment, particularly with tidal field? If the, um, one, one could imagine certain uh, geom symmetries uh, where um, uh, the uh, modulation of telefisher relation zero point or, sc or scatter with the environment is correlated with the tidal field. And that and then again would exactly um, correspond to an uh, analog of intrinsic alignments. So uh, my student Yu Shu Huang has been looking into this um, using Elastro CNG, where we're exactly now figuring out how much um, deviations from the telefisher relation of individual galaxies uh, lead to spurious shears uh, in the major axis component, and then correlate this uh, spurious shear from deviations from the telefisher relation with tidal field and galaxy density. Here's an example of what, what that looks like, just as a narrow slice from the simulation 
um, of density and showing you uh, the galaxy shapes imprinted from um, from deviations from telefish relation. Uh, we don't detect the cross correlation function um, 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 at the significant at the level of the um, 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 constraining power of the lattice boxes. So this is good news. Let me uh, complete my shear systematics um, com um, um, table here by saying that intrinsic alignment analogs so far are at, at most a very weak contribution. And uh, we are still going through some more detailed analysis of um, PNG galaxies to make sure that the um, kinematic substructure is really accounted for by the telefish relation scatter. And that was that, let me conclude. I, have, uh, I hope I've sh shown you how uh, the combination of imaging and galaxy kinematics breaks the degeneracy of intrinsic um, galaxy shape and shear. And that is, uh, will lead to a, a factor 10 reduction in shape noise, which means that we can compensate for reduced uh, source density. And this looks um, feasible and really promising even with the roaming grizzle. And then I've talked you through a bunch more uh, um, uh, projects that we're working on right now to mature this uh, into a competitive weak lensing technique. Thank you. Questions? Thank you. Uh, so I have a question about the uh, redshift range you can reach. Like, the, you know, it depends on the instruments, but uh, you need a decent uh, resolution of that image. Right. So, like for for example, for LSSD and the Roman, to which redshift you can go with a kinematic lensing. So far, we've limited uh, these forecasts largely to about redshift of two, which for um, which for Roman was not size limited. But uh, to do this kind of inference, we need the telefish relation to be in place, and at uh, much higher redshifts, uh, things become um, really irregular. Which of course also means that this would not be the preferred weak lensing technique uh, for um, phenomena at beyond redshift two. But if we're measuring lambda CDM or standard WCDM, then um, limiting below relative two does not really matter much. Going higher would just mean that you meta measure meta domination really, really well. I see. Okay. Thank you. Um, may I ask? Well, really, really cool idea. It looks like a very, very hard problem, but you've convinced me. Um, <clears throat> what about SKA? A deep SKA survey, is that going to help here? No. He said no. I have not gone through those forecasts, and I, off the top of my head, I don't know enough about um, the, um, the resolution and uh, retro coverage, but it would be interesting to look at. Of course, it will again need overlapping imaging. Well, uh, so there'll be LSST imaging over the whole southern sky, and then <clears throat> there'll be a deep SKA survey over tens of 10,000 square degrees, something like that. Might be interesting. So I had a question about what you raised at the end, the question of how intrinsically round spiral galaxies are. Um, I mean, don't you already know that? that if they were round, then the shear should have a sp the shear distribution should have a spike at zero shear, right? Why? Which you measure. I don't follow, to be honest. If they're not round, it'll be smeared out, right? If you have a randomly distributed set of of of, of uh, circular discs, then there's a high probability to to see them face on. The, the, the probability density is infinite, right? Because there's quite a lot of, um, you know, I'm trying to show a vector pointing at my eye. There's quite a lot of solid angle. Well, edge on. No, no, you're, I, the total probability is dominated by edge on. The probability density is infinite, has a spike at, at, at face on. So I think you already know from, you know, just photometric observations. The, the other thing that I would have thought... So we are not assuming infinitely thin disks. We do have a disk scale height. Uh, okay. Yeah. The, the other thing I was thinking, I mean, have you used manga data or what's the other one? The 
the Australian one. Yes. The, so we are working. Sammy, yeah. yeah, we are working on manga data, but uh, exactly as it as a check that um, uh, astrophysical systematics do not introduce shear. Was the thinking that these galaxies are at such a low redshift that they're effectively unsheared. So any shear that we recover from kinematic lensing would be due to insufficient astrophysical modeling. That's something we're work, uh, actively working on. Thanks. It, uh, so we have three questions. Uh, we'll try and make it short. So uh, I'm curious um, how trustworthy the TNG predictions will be because um, there's a paper saying that the uh, um, fundamental plane uh, of TNG galaxies is kind of wrong. So um, I'm curious about whether they got TF correctly. They also don't get TF uh, entirely correct, but we're not proposing to calibrate television relation parameters from T TNG. We are only looking whether there's a correlation with environment or not. And then at the end, we will run that same um, analysis also on magneticum for a cross check. Right, but I'm, I'm not sure whether this, uh, I mean, if TNG says there's no correlation, uh, how, how trustworthy that is. Of course, it's something that we should still check afterwards, but I think it's one step up in assurance. Uh, I don't think anyone can do any definite conclusion from one particular flavor of simulation. Uh, but uh, given that standard intrinsic alignments uh, do show up uh, in most simulations, uh, this is, I think, uh, already um, a good step. Uh, so mine's a slightly different flavor. Uh, this was about Ali Fisher, but if you were doing fundamental plane and elliptical galaxies, the effect of lensing correlating with offsets from the fundamental plane, you, have you looked at that problem? So there's other groups uh, working on using that for magnification, uh, because uh, I don't think you can recover two shear components in that case. Due no, to right, right, but yeah. but uh, yes, I'm aware of other groups working on magnification um, estimates for that. Uh, we are not at the moment. 